Very good afternoon to all of you. I'm ever so thankful once again to have you all join us for today's Bible study. We left off with Elisha prophesying unto the king of Israel about the siege that was happening within the very city that they were in. Even Elisha was in it. Samaria, the capital of, of the northern kingdom of Israel. The Syrians had come up, besieged the city. And everyone was wondering if they were all going to just starve to death because everyone was starving. And Elisha makes the prophecy and uh, the Syrians flee. And Elisha is shown once again to be the man of God. So after the Syrians flee from the city and that all takes place, we pick up right here. Then spake Elisha unto the Shunammite woman, whose son he had restored to life. Okay, stop right there. If you'll remember back in 2 Kings 4, this woman, real quick, this was the Shunammite woman, her and her husband. They loved Elisha so much that they built a room onto their home for him. This is a wealthy woman, very wealthy. Her whole family's wealthy. And she builds a room on for Elisha. Elisha, he wishes to bless her, the Lord does, and gives her a little boy. Well, the boy dies. She runs to Elisha. Elisha comes back, and he had restored the boy to life. It was the second resurrection that ever takes place in the scripture. Well, this woman, once again, Elisha knows that there's about to be a seven-year-long famine in Israel. And because he cherishes her just as much as she does him, they're friends. Just because of that, he wishes to warn her to get out of the land before this famine occurs. So Elisha speaks unto this Shunammite woman, whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise, and go thou and thine household, and sojourn wheresoever thou canst sojourn, for the Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land seven years. And the woman arose, and did after the saying of the man of God, and she went with her household, and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. We're often told in the scriptures about how difficult that it is for a rich person to come into the kingdom of God in order to lay all down for Jesus. And that's the whole point of, of Christ. Well, this woman actually does that. It's one of the rare occurrences. In, but she moves from the northern kingdom and comes down here into the enemy territory of the Philistine land. For seven years, she remains there while there's this heavy famine in Israel. Well, by doing that, though, and leaving her property and coming into an enemy, another enemy nation, she forfeits her uh, estate, her houses, her homes, whatever that she owns that was in Israel left behind is now someone else's. So she comes to plead after these seven years, she comes out of the Philistine land and she comes to plead back for her household and for or for her homes and and all that. And it came to pass at the seven years end that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines and she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. And the king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha hath done. So the king's curiosity is piqued. And it came to pass as Gehazi was telling the king how Elisha had restored a dead body to life, that, behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life cried to the king for her house and for her land. And Gehazi said, My lord, O king, this is the woman, and this is her son, whom Elisha restored to life. I like what Jamison Fawcett Brown said about this. The providence of God so ordained that King Jehoram had been led to inquire with great interest into the miraculous deeds of Elisha and that the prophet's servant was in the act of relating the marvelous incident of the restoration of the Shunammite son when she made her appearance to prefer her request. I can actually say in my own life that I've had so many times the uh, things like this occur right when you need them, they occur. You know, someone comes in and it's just the perfect storm to have done that which you wish or God wills, a uh, better way to say it. Matthew Henry said this, sometimes events small in themselves prove of consequence as here. For they made the king ready to believe 
Gehazi's narrative when thus confirmed. It made him ready to grant her request and to support a life which was given once and again by miracle. Cambridge said this, this would be among the greatest of the great works of Elisha, and Jehoram's interest would be consequently be at its height. So hearing about this resurrection in the land, you just imagine that. Hearing about this man of God able to go in, pray unto God, and then this child come back from the dead. That would have totally have thrown anyone it, it, even at this very moment just thinking about the whole concept of someone coming back from the dead means that <clears throat> death isn't final that they're just somewhere else besides in their body and they can be brought back into their body if god so wills so the king jehoram this would have piqued him to such a degree that he would have desired to bless this Shunammite woman in a great way because obviously God loves her and he's probably thinking that if he shows favor to her and Elisha and his servant, then maybe he can get in good with God in some way. Joseph Benson said, that is, she confirmed what Gehazi had said. Thus did God even force him to believe what he might have had some color to question, speaking of the king, if he had only Gehazi's word for it. <clears throat> it would have been much more difficult to only believe Gehazi, but just so happened this woman is in the very vicinity and speaking to you right now that it actually happened. So there's uh, in the mouth of two or, two or more, two or three witnesses, shall the matter be settled. So, I mean, this would have been just a great uplifting moment for the king, for the Shunammite woman, for the family, the palace. Everything would have rejoiced at this. And when the king asked the woman, she told him. So the king appointed unto her a certain officer, saying, Restore all that was hers and all the fruits of the field since the day that she left the land, even until now. Now we're coming to the event where Elisha is picking up where Elijah had left off. The Lord had told Elijah in the cave right before he goes to meet Elisha. God had told Elijah to anoint Hazel, the king of Syria. And that is where we pick up on this specific occasion. And this is very tragic read. This is one of the most tragic reads in the entire Bible. Just listen to this. <clears throat> and Elisha came to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad the king of Syria was sick, and it was told him, saying, The man of God is come hither. Now this would have been quite a little trek for Elisha, coming from Israel all the way up here into Damascus. And the king said unto Hazel, Take a present in thine hand, and go, meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? So the Syrian king Ben-Hadad has a disease. He's very sick. And he wishes to inquire of Elisha. Elisha is so highly respected in the land at this point that every, every nation, even the enemy nations of Israel, respect him. But he is telling Hazel... His servant, basically his right-hand man, go take a gift unto the prophet Elisha, because Elisha was in the vicinity. Go and take a present unto him and ask him if I'll recover. So Hazel went to meet Elisha and took a present with him, even of every good thing of Damascus, forty camels burden, and came and stood before him and said, Thy son Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, hath sent me to thee, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? And Elisha said unto him, Go, say unto him, Thou mayest certainly recover, howbeit the Lord hath showed me that he shall surely die. What a strange reply. Yes, he'll recover, but he'll also die. Notice Elisha doesn't say any more than that about that matter. Now pay very close attention. And Elisha settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed. And the man of God wept. So Elisha's sitting there, and the Lord shows him what Hazel, whom is standing right in front of him, 
the Lord is showing him all the terrifying things that Hazael is going to do once that he becomes king. <clears throat> and Elisha settled his countenance steadfastly on Hazael. He's looking right at Hazael. And he's just, he's getting this vision of what's happening. Elisha's actually seeing what is going to happen. And he weeps over it. And he is looking at Hazael so long during this. Seeing this vision, he apparently just loses all sense of what what else is happening. His attention is totally focused on what Hazel is going to do. And Hazel becomes ashamed. Hazel actually turns, like, turns his head, gets kind of embarrassed. Charles Ellicott said this, Hazel, conscious that Elisha had read his thoughts aright, shrank from that piercing gaze. Joseph Benson said this, Elisha fixed his eyes on Hazel and looked upon him so earnestly, so long, and with such a settled countenance that Hazel was ashamed as apprehending that the prophet discerned or suspected something of an evil and shameful nature in him. How would you like that to be talking to a prophet of God and they just focus on you? And you know how you can kind of tell what someone's thinking? Well, with a prophet, I'd say that that resonates a whole lot stronger. <laughs> you know, so Hazel is really in a what's going on type of mode. But then it says that Elisha weeps right after. He's so horrified by what he's seen from the Lord. That he weeps. G. Campbell Morgan said, Elisha's tears were in themselves signs of his understanding of the necessity for those severe judgments which must fall upon the guilty nation of Israel. But they were the outcome of his deep love for his people. And Hazel said, Why weepeth, my Lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, and their young men wilt thou slay with the sword, and wilt dash their children, and rip up their women with child. And Hazel said, But what, is thou serving a dog, that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord hath showed me that thou shalt be king over Syria. This takes me aback, especially while studying it. Hazel's replies immediately, but what? Is thy servant a dog that he should do, should do such a great... Hazel doesn't believe himself capable of doing what Elisha just said. And I believe, my opinion, that many, many, if not all, nearly, evil rulers, <clears throat> whenever they first begin, they have, or at least in a young age, they have good intentions to rule the people. I don't think anyone starts out outright evil. I don't even think that Hitler would have thought to wind up the way that he did. But it's this gradual process of becoming evil. And I believe that the Antichrist in our day will be much like this Hazel. He's going to come in wanting peace and peace and then He's just going to become outright evil. We see that happen to leaders all the time. And that's how he'll gain such a power. That's usually how they gain such power. Matthew Poole commented on Hazel referring to himself as a dog. A dog, either so vile and unworthy as this expression is used, or so impudent for which dogs are noted, or, as I believe, so fierce and barbarous and inhuman. Charles Spurgeon, a Calvinist back in his day, Charles Spurgeon actually said this about the question whether Hazel, because he would do all the things that Elisha just told him. So that leads many people to wonder, is this a self-fulfilling prophecy? Elisha, if Elisha never told Hazel this, would Hazel have ever committed the acts that we're about to read about? Charles Spurgeon said this, God foreknew the mischief that he would do. When he came to the throne, speaking of Hazel, 
yet that that foreknowledge did not in the least degree interfere with Hazel's free agency, meaning that he still had free will. Like many Calvinists, Spurgeon, he this is just a quick note on what Spurgeon believed about free will. He believed that whenever it came to doing evil, then man had free will. Because that's just, he believed that it's just God allowing our, the nature of man to play out. So Hazel departed from Elisha and came to his master, Ben-Hadad, who said to him, What said Elisha to thee? And he answered, He told me that thou shouldest surely recover. Hazel only tells him half the prophecy. And it came to pass on the morrow that Hazel took a thick cloth and dipped it in water and spread it on the king's face so that he died and Hazel reigned in his stead. Now, I believe that Hazel was already planning on doing this. This is the reason why he turned away from Elisha, because he knew that the prophet seen what he was going to do. But Matthew Henry commented on just how corrupt a man can become with the thoughts of royalty and uh, money and fame, all of these things. And just how corrupting that that influence can be. He said, those that are little and low in the world cannot imagine how strong the temptations of power and prosperity are. Which, if ever they arrive at, they will find how deceitful their hearts are. How much worse than they suspected. And in the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, being then king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. So just a real quick catch up on where we are at. We see two Jehorams or Jorams reigning at the same time. We have Ahab's son, Joram, reigning over the northern kingdom of Israel. And then we have Jehoshaphat's Jehoram reigning over Judah. Thirty and two years old was Jehoram when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. Now unlike his father and grandfather, Jehoshaphat and Asa, Jehoram is a wicked king over Judah. And he's the first wicked king in a, quite a few years now. But he comes along and he is married to the daughter of Jezebel and Ahab, whom, whose name is Ethaliah, to which we'll learn about Ethaliah this week. She is a very evil woman in the same respects as her mother Jezebel. And it's believed that she corrupts Jehoram. And Jehoram walked in the way of the kings of Israel as did the house of Ahab, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David his servant's sake, as he promised him to give him always a light and to his children. In Jehoram's day, Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. So real quick, I'm just going to catch everyone up. <clears throat> okay. The king right up here is Jehoram over the northern kingdom of Israel. The king right here over the southern kingdom of Judah is also named Jehoram. These two empires now, or these two nations, are connected through marriage. The king of Judah, Jehoram, is married to Ethaliah. Edom, which is down here was under the control of Judah. They lose control of Edom, which is south of them, which they had under control for so many years. So Joram went over to Zer and all the chariots with him, and he rose by night and smote the Edomites, which compassed him about, and the captains of the chariots and the people fled into their tents. This would have been right around Sodom, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, Yet Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. Then Libna revolted at the same time. Now they're finding rebellion within Judah itself. So right here we're being told about how not only is Edom revolting, which is south, but within their own vicinity. And the rest of the acts of Joram and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? 
Just a little bit more on this king before we leave off the study today. Just a little bit more. In Second Chronicles 21, we're told about how evil that this king is, Jehoram, the king of Judah. He is so evil that once that he takes the throne, he actually kills his brothers and others in order to secure his authority on the throne. Well, he's so evil, he continues in this evil, so much so that Elijah, the prophet, actually wrote him a letter telling him, prophesying unto him. Second Chronicles 21 tells us, And there came a writing to King Jehoram of Judah from Elijah the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of David thy father, Because thou hast not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat thy father, nor in the ways of Asa king of Judah, meaning his father and grandfather, Behold, with a great plague will the Lord smite thy people, and thy children, and thy wives, and all thy goods. And thou shalt have great sickness by disease of thy bowels, until thy bowels fall out by reason of the sickness day by day. So not, not only is Jehoram a wicked king, but his death is just horrible. It lasts for two years. He has this horrible disease of the bowels. Joseph Benson commented on it. He was afflicted with a complication of diseases, together with his dysentery, all which were very grievous and a suitable punishment of his horrid wickedness. Now, dysentery is um, called, it's an infection of the bowels where diarrhea comes out. It's it's really gruesome. You know, blood and mucus is involved in it. For, and for two years, this would have afflicted him. And I'm convinced that it is because of his uh, meddling with these evil rulers, these evil people. Even his wife is just like Jezebel. First Corinthians, Paul the Apostle told us, the church, he says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And in case you're wanting a little bit more detail on what evil communications is, Albert Barnes says this, The word rendered communications means properly a being together, companionship, close contact, converse. It refers not to discourse only, like talking to someone, but to contact or companionship. Paul the Apostle is saying, don't become friends with the wicked. You'll become like them. And Joram slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his stead. In the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, did Ahaziah, the son of Je Jehoram, king of Judah, begin to reign. Two and twenty years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. And he reigned one year in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Athaliah the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. Omri is actually her grandfather. Her father and mother, once again, Ahab and Jezebel, remember that name. Very evil woman. And Ahaziah walked in the way of the house of Ahab, and did evil in the sight of the Lord, as did the house of Ahab, for he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. So just in case you're wondering where we're at right now with these kings, Jehoram is now dead, Ahaziah his son is in command, and Joram is still on the throne in the northern kingdom of Israel. And Ahaziah went with Joram, the son of Ahab, to the war against Hazael, king of Syria, and Ramoth Gilead, and the Syrians wounded Joram. And King Joram went back to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him at Ramah, when he fought against Hazael, king of Syria, and Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab, in Jezreel, because he was sick. So we see Ahaziah, the king of Judah, coming up to see Jehoram, or Joram, if you will, the king of the northern kingdom, whom is wounded by Hazel at Ramoth Gilead. He flees all the way back to Jezreel, and he is wounded. And on that note, will we, <clears throat> Lord willing, pick up tomorrow with Jehu? You do not want to miss this. Jehu is one of the most 
he's like a Leonidas, Alexander the Great. I mean, this guy, he just, you talk about a mighty man of war. Jehu, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it, God willing. But uh, that is the study for today. I hope that you all learned something. May the Lord of peace, love, and mercy be with you. Amen.